I have two quick comments that I didn't have time yesterday to make. One is just to call to your attention the, uh, from the introductory material I gave you on page 14. That is nothing but a summary of the factors that appeared alone or in combination that were relevant to a modal change. So if uh, you're interested in the potentiality of modal change of a country whose future you do not yet know, one good test is to see how they come out on those uh, various factors, which we will do. The, one, the other thing I didn't get covered, if you look at the, uh, the total uh, progression of uh, the modal history, you will see that uh, one mode uh, tremendously uh, uh, overshadows the other, in, in the others in terms of uh, length of time th that it prevailed. And what is the obvious one? Am in one form or another. Uh, the Am has ruled the West for over 2,000 years, while the I's and D's together have about 450 years, about a quarter of the time. And I think that this is an instructive fact, an explicable fact, and a significant fact. And if you want to know why, ask in the question period, presuming I have the decency to leave one. All right, now the next three lectures, I think you will find less theoretical and more relevant because they're on the United States today. Well, more exactly, two of them are on the United States today, and then the last one is on the United States tomorrow. So now we've taken a survey of the past, and presumably we've discovered a rel we know the uh, relevant factors in modal change, but what is the application to today? If we want to predict the future, we have to know not just the past, but the present. We can't know to what mode we are moving until we know from what condition we are starting. Now, it's broadly recognized, quite outside objectivism too, that Western culture after medievalism, uh, or after modern science, overthrew medievalism and broadly turned secular. Uh, of course, religion has remained alive, but for a long time, it has been a remnant of the past, relegated to the back burner, not a factor shaping the minds of artists, uh, scientists, uh, uh, educators, and so on. So secularism has been the modern tendency. Uh, but secularism comes in several varieties with potentially different strengths, weaknesses, and lifespans. So we have to now see where exactly does each of these varieties stand in the U.S. today. Uh, and that will give us a clue, an orientation of where we might be going. Now, I define secular modes in this context as Anyone that gives reality to this world, whether primary or derivative. In other words, denies the exclusive reality of the supernatural. So obviously, a medieval or a Platonist is, is, is not secular. But that would mean you come out with the two Ds, will have no truck, D1 and D2 with the supernatural. M1 does, but it still maintains the reality of this world. And of course, I. And since I already, in part one, identified the West, Western culture as dominated by uh, the two Ds, uh, and I'm counting on you having some uh, understanding of that from general knowledge and objectivist literature, I'm going to turn to the Ds and see where they stand uh, and what condition they're in now. Uh, the Ds, as you recall, attempt to integrate Kant with some Aristotle 
And their, uh, their attempt led to an unprecedented limitation of the cognitive role of concepts. I explained the logic of that uh, in the uh, intro handout that I gave you. So in this sense, it's a parallel to M1, a combination of incompatibles in regard to integration allows a number of mutually exclusive interpretations, all within the definition of that one mode. Now, I go into all, a number of these possibilities in the book, but it amounts to there's a range within D1 that's closer to Aristotle, although still basically Kant is their base. And there's a range that's closer to Kant where the Aristotle is deteriorating, being minimized. So we, we saw this development in M1. What is the face of D1 today? Now, it's about 150 years after the rise of its constituent elements, naturalism uh, in literature, positivism in science, early mixed economy in politics. Has D1 followed the pattern of M1, the ancient mixed mode? Have we seen across that time the base going up, being emphasized, taking over more of thought, uh, and the derivative, as they see it, the Aristotelian element, being downplayed, getting weaker, has there, in other words, been a progression within the D1 mode since its beginning in the mid-19th century? Uh, and thereby producing a culture moving ever further away from the conceptual orientation. Well, let us look at a couple of those areas, just touch on them. Take naturalism. <clears throat> and that was the definition of serious art from the mid-19th century. It knocked out Romanticism and took over. And it lasted for about a century as the dominant uh, art. Well, its manifesto from the outset was universal themes are inapplicable to uh, the novel. Our concern, the novelist's concern, is not to present, quote, man, unquote, which the Romanticists try to do, but rather these men here and now not some abstraction, but the concrete uh, that we observe. Now, early people in this tradition, such as you know, great writers like Balzac and Tolstoy, took that as far wide as you could. They regarded their work as descriptions, well, not of human nature everywhere, but at least of whole nations and eras, you know, Russia uh, under Napoleon, for example. It didn't take long, however. Few generations. We had naturalists like Sinclair Lewis and Upton Sinclair, who thought this kind of, stop gesturing, uh, this kind of broad uh, coverage uh, uh, was artificial, lacking in real detail, too sweeping and generalized for an artwork which should be very specific, capture the concrete perceptual reality. Uh, you know, that was Combe's definition of, of positive. Percepts, not concepts. And so you got a novel like uh, Main Street depicting the problems of life in a small Midwestern town in the 1920s as not exactly the scope of War and Peace. Or, or in Upton Sinclair, you have a novel concerned with the working conditions in the meatpacking industry in 1906. Now, you think that's about as non-conceptual as you can get, but absolutely not, because today, themes of this sort are disdained as didactic. You know, up to think they wanted to change the meatpacking industry. Uh, and above all, as too abstract. Now we read novels about someone's play of moods as he remembers a sense of alienation that he experienced last August while uh, squinting through 
broken glasses into a murky distance. Now, there's still a description of uh, something, but uh, you see that it's the, the whole progression is to give way to a non-story, non-character, non-theme, and that, of course, would be modernism art in our D2, where the whole idea of description is gone because it needs conceptualization, and that's shrinking, shrinking. Now, if you look at education, we call it the pluralist. The pluralist in education says no one goal, no principle uh, of the curriculum, no uh, one uh, method. It's American high school today for you. Any uh, purpose, related or unrelated, any uh, subject uh, uh, is okay. Now, at the beginning of that uh, uh, movement, uh, the main form that it took was not a derogation of concepts, but the school's indifference to integrating classical studies with modern science. Classical, they inherited from eternity. School had to do it, and modern science, you had to be up to date, and they just juxtaposed. There was no common to They just threw it in along with vocational training. But in that early stage, in the 1800s, there was a high conceptual level of content. These were early D1 schools. And the best single example is the McGuffey's Reader of uh, 1879, which was, a, he himself said, an eclectic collection. But if you read it, it's difficult abstract pieces uh, designed to improve the thinking of primary school students. If you introduced that in the schools today, there'd be a riot. Uh, to, to demand that of uh, these, this type of student. But then as time went on, classical studies waned, history waned, the curriculum exploded in all directions and splintered into uh, subdivisions unrelated. And uh, there was more and more rapid movement in most subject areas toward perceptual level teaching and learning. Textbooks with visuals rather than uh, with text. Uh, and one of the recent ones that I heard about is that literature should not be taught and is not taught. And that it's much more amenable to the student to give him, quote, media classes instead of literature at all. And these classes, as one person defined it, teach television, newspapers, car magazine, car repair magazines, and movies. Now, when that's the conceptual level of the school, you know, there's no opposition to progressive educators who basically say, do the same thing, but do it as you feel like. Now, if you look at politics, most of the 19th century D1s upheld, not as absolutes, of course, because their, their viewpoint prohibited absolutes, but they upheld many elements of capitalism such as private property, prior freedom of trade, freedom of pricing, of hiring, freedom of interest setting. They had no such idea as the Fed, for instance. But inherent in their whole approach of D1 is distrust of systems. You know, where everything is integrated according to basic principles. That's the destruction of D1. That has to be either M or I. So, they regarded the elements of capitalism that they did approve of as unrelated to each other. So you could add or subtract, and that was no, no intellectual problem. Maybe it didn't work, but didn't find that out until you tried it. And maybe if you tinkered with something, the, the head of the SEC or you know, put another committee in, it would work. The, the later D1s and other were, came to regard the earlier D1 attitude, even although it had been unsystematic, as rigid, above all because it was too broad. They, they said, how can you talk about freedom, private property? These concepts are not going to tell us 
how to solve problems with the railroads, with uh, uh, people that, that don't, uh, that, that overcompete, or industries that undercompete, and uh, what should we do about protecting domestic industries, interests? We can get rid of protectionism as such, as though it's some principle that we can cope with. Pluralism, our view, some protectionism is okay under some circumstances. You get the idea. Some control of railroads and so on and so on. Now, today's D1s think even this type of question is too general. They don't debate, should there be some protectionism or other? Because you're already conceptualizing what you're doing as protectionism. Uh, their questions that they debate in committees is on this order. What size tariff should be imposed this year on LCD television sets from Japan to prevent employment rising above 6% in domestic industries, industries that compete? Uh, and for how long should this tariff stay on, considering there's going to be retaliation from abroad and outcry from consumers at home and infected indus affected industries at home. Now, that's a, a real problem. <laughs> because, you know, talking about freedom and free trade and protectionism, you're talking about, I mean, you see what you're talking about. So, of course, you know that your decision can't be alienating some uh, important voting group unless you can make an arrangement to keep them happy later. And that might in turn lead to problematic deals, but they'll be worried about uh, when they come. You know, Lord Keynes is guiding even principle. In the long run, we'll all be dead. Uh, or as Louis XIV put it, après moi, the deluge. Now, but this is the epistemology. There are a lot of, of course, other elements, but this is the epistemology behind government controls growing. And they grew piecemeal, that's a key word. One at a time, always, well, this is not a violation of anything, there's one change to fix one thing, and that's all. Because the idea of principles is incompatible with this mode. Uh, I would put it this way. I don't know if I put this on in the intro, but the crucial concept to cover all of these in literature, in education, in every field, is conceptual shrinkage. Conceptual shrinkage. And that is inherent in the D1 mode, quite independent of the zeal of leftists who are not D1. That zeal, of course, is a key factor but it has to have a receptive uh, uh, mentality that will take the far left one at a time and say, oh, that's okay, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, changing it. And by the same token, the, uh, or just another way of putting it, the D1 comes to despise ideology because ideology is an abstract system. These are my political social principles. And the Marxists had it, the medievals had it, the, uh, the, the uh, communists, the, the, the Nazis had it. But uh, their whole idea is you can't function there. Uh, you're, that's a pretense that you've got the absolute truth answers all nicely worked up. We deal with everything one at a time, and as soon as somebody opens his mouth and says, uh, four score and seven years ago. Well, that's fine for rhetoric, but that has nothing to do with. Uh, so you see again, D1 has moved and moved and moved to the point that no ideology is necessary to get in on the government. In fact, no ideology is a boost welcomed by Republicans and Democrats alike. So uh, maybe the room is there for an ideology for an anti-ideology to come in and do its own thing and no one will know because it's just piecemeal. Uh, I think that give you an idea. Now, I'd like to take a moment to give you a little more specific indication 
because this is really a crucial point, of the inner logic of D1s destroying itself. And you can see it all over. But I just want to point it out. This should be really familiar to you. But look at it from the point of view of a D1 mind, not just a, an evasive obstreperous. Start, let's say, with the founding fall. Uh, the, the claim man has a right to life, and that entails the rights to liberty and property. The D1 comes right back, says, why are you talking about the right to life? All you really want is a government that leaves your person and your goods alone. So to talk about a life in this concept is just abstraction. That's some kind of metaphysical thing uh, you're, you're throwing in. It's empty. The government would act exactly the same the way you want if you didn't talk about life. So now where are we? We have two rights, liberty and property, deliberately interpreted as unconnected. And that's the way the D1 wants them. So where do we go from there? Well, how do we know what behavior is subsumed under those two? Now, if we get them from life, we know the principles of life. We can see why. And we can see exactly to what extent where these apply. But if they're two disconnected uh, primaries, how do you know what liberty implies? Uh, does it mean you can do anything? Uh, or is there certain concretes only to which is limited? Like, for instance, the right to free speech. The D1 will run right in and say, no, you can't talk about the right to free speech as though that's some kind of, that was Justice Douglas long ago, but he's, a, he's long been superseded. Uh, you have to say, you can't, you can't try to relate. There's so many different types of free speech cases. How can you put them together under some loose word like that? Uh, yes, you're right, he said. Liberty does include free speech, but not some kind of all-encompassing guiding uh, generality. What about on TV, especially when children are watching? Uh, what about hate speech that would offend uh, minorities? What about if it's obscene, judged by the standards of Poughkeepsie? Uh, what if a man calls out fire in a theater? That's Oliver Wendell Holmes. Just to talk about mouth off, he would say, just to mouth off about liberty. What does that tell you? That doesn't answer any of those questions. It's an abstraction. We need concrete answers to concrete questions. And obviously, liberty is irrelevant to coming to uh, the answers. Now, this process is what I call clarity through disintegration. A clarity, every time you don't, you know, you have a broad principle, that's unclear, break it up. And then you have the next set of principles on narrower abstraction, but that's unclear. And it only becomes clear when it reaches the perceptual level, which is exactly uh, what the D1 uh, school uh, is moving to. So I won't uh, be labeled, but you know that at the end, man's rights become a label for an arbitrary juxtaposition of shifting, concrete bound decisions. With each act of disintegration, we are confronted by an ever greater morass of unrelated concretes. The more you cut back on the integrating power of concepts, the less the remaining concepts are of cognitive uh, help to you. And so they too are, are cut back. And that indeed is what the, what the Ds have done. So the ultimate result is scorn for concepts. Even though they try to bring Aristotle in, where Auguste Comte, believe it or not, the father of all this, thought he had found a universal principle that explained everything. But you know, that was not within his actual philosophy, and it sure collapsed fast. Uh, but today, this stuff is taught to Americans as to American students as though it's not even contestable. Anybody who is taught at American University knows the enthusiastic certainty with which 
that his classes pounce on him if he is benighted enough to declare an absolute. Even something like, I was shocked when I first started teaching. Even if you say two and two is four, that's an absolute. I would say at least half the class waves their hands. They can't tolerate such a foolish statement. And the standard answer right away is out of their mouth. Oh, that's only to the base 10. And besides, if you mix two quarts of water with two quarts of alcohol, it's not four. So that's ridiculous. It's, it's a convention. It works sometimes. That is very, very, very widespread. Uh, Modern thinkers adopted D1 uh, because they regarded it as necessary to the pursuit of science. Kant had cl closed out reality, but if they take this view, uh, they'll be able to do it. But they increasingly lost their confidence in the power of conceptual thought and ended up being perception only. And that's why you hear so many people today say, when you give them an argument, that's only semantics, that's just theory, that's true by your arbitrary definition, that's dogma, all of that, that is, is this, the end result of conceptual uh, shrinkage. So in the end, the, the uh, D1 saw that you cannot combine Kant and Aristotle. <clears throat> they started out as a real effort to combine two opposites, both of which they thought were indispensable, just like the medievals, by its very nature. The combination pushed them to drop one in favor of the other. So you see the same law as governed the mixed mode. They tried to combine paganism and Platonism and fell into Christianity. When you have two elements uh, leading to incompatible or demanding incompatible performances, the end result has got to be the unbreached rule of the one which is the base. A mixed mode, M or D, always contains the seeds of its own destruction. And that's very important if you are trying to analyze what's going to happen to a country. <clears throat> now here, I think, is a very good overview paragraph, if I say so myself, on the ones, in other words, M1 and D1. I give you a perspective on the whole picture here. Ancient M1 tried to reject this world with its acceptance. And in the process, they turned ever more to the realm of floating abstractions while reducing reliance on the world of experience and thereby ended up losing the world of experience. The modern D1 tried to unite the rejection of concepts with their partial acceptance, in the process becoming ever more concrete bound while reducing reliance on the faculty of abstract thought, which they ended up losing. <clears throat> now here's a, a, an excellent summary statement, if I say so myself. M1 displays perceptual shrinkage. D1 per, displays conceptual shrinkage. I will put that down as a really good summary. But the, these two, M1 and D1, are not the same in all things because one is the supremacy of Plato and the other is the supremacy of Kant. Plato being a champion of philosophy and Kant being an opponent of a concept. So the M1s in the ancient world uh, champion philosophy. Even the late M1s were still pagan. They still wanted if you look at Marcus Aurelius, for instance, you, you look at Epictetus, they still wanted systematic thought within the framework of an integrated philosophy. And they used this viewpoint 
to decry all the mysticism and pure Orientalism that was coming in, up to a point. I mean, so long as there was enough of their view uh, left. D1s have a different attitude in uh, dropping concept. They drop philosophy. And they, they are the most uniquely non-philosophical in the whole history. The two most unphilosophical predecessors of today's D1s are the Romans, who thought that philosophy was impractical, and uh, the founding fathers, who believed that uh, the important questions had already been answered. But the D ones have a much deeper reason for rejecting philosophy. They believe that the essence of their mode, of their mental set, is incompatible with the very nature of philosophy, which is this broad principle overview. Now, of course, the D ones stay in philosophy in the negative sense. They say, metaphysically, or they wouldn't use that word, but the objects we experience are not to be described as reality in the sense of uh, some independent external world. And man's mind is not a tool of knowledge. Uh, uh, it can do nothing beyond noting the flow of unrelated sense experience. So it's two negations, reality and the conceptual faculty. Now, obviously, it would be important to prediction that you could quantify how far the shrinkage uh, had gone to say, well, uh, out of a scale of 100, we're 78% of the way. But that's obviously, obviously impossible. I do think, however, you can say this. Given the progression from the mid-19th to today of that particular mode, I don't see how you can avoid saying no Western society in history has ever been as anti-conceptual as our own. Kant's approach, his takeover, has been so thorough and so swift that our current culture today would have been unimaginable even 50 years ago. That's the speed, and you see some of the examples I give you, how far it's gone in the uh, rejection of concepts. Now, a quick word, I hope it's quick, uh, on the number of D1s in the United States. Now, there's all kinds of factors involved in modal changeover. So the number uh, uh, is not in itself very important, but it's not necessarily irrelevant either. Condensing a long reasoning, I think D1s primarily come out of college, and uh, you can count them in relation to uh, uh, college graduates in the so-called soft uh, areas. And uh, there's about 600,000 Soft BAs are granted every year in the US. Uh, and uh, if we allow, obviously, a good number of them are not, you know, they just go to college to get a husband or wife and it doesn't mean anything to them. And there's a lot of D1s in other areas. Make all those adjustments and take some wild guesses. I'm going to skip all that. I'll work it out in, in the book. I come up with a figure of about 15 million within the parameters of the relevant age, because after a couple of generations, no matter what you believe in college, life and backache and so on takes you out of philosophy. So it's about 5% of the US population uh, that feeds the uh, establishment in every uh, key cultural area now. Now, D2, what is its status? M1 led by its nature to M2, and as I've indicated, D1 leads to D2. The man who now sees concepts are to be dispensed with, even the partial integration of D1 is a concession to the enemy, so down with any idea of a connected story, a structured curriculum, a principled government, all of this is fantasy, 
a shimmer all left over from a discredited past. <clears throat> now, I don't mean to say that the only root of D2 is the uh, disintegration uh, evolution of D1. That's certainly one. But uh, that's not the only operative cause, just as in the ancient world, M1 was not the only, there was a torrent, an influx of oriental mysticism over and above that. Uh, in other words, in this case, there have been avant-garde moralists, uh, moderns, coming straight from Kant, scorning the D1 progression from the beginning. But my point, my view would be that while there are these independent uh, D2s, um, uh, 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 they did not and could not become a cultural power directly. You couldn't throw them into the 19th century and have them take over. There would be a rebellion. First, you needed a long transition through D1, and then these, what initially were regarded as freaks and monsters by society, uh, you know, became the, the spokesman. <clears throat> Now, another important point here. Uh, the uh, division within the D movement is real, one versus two. But actually, there is not much cultural rivalry between them at this point. If you look around you, you'll see that the D2s, the various modernists, have found little difficulty in existing and even being institutionalized, taking over the museums, many of the schools, lots of the government, lionized and subsidized within a D1 world, especially in our later stages. Of <clears throat> now, that, that was not true in the ancient world. Even late in their development, the M1, since they were so hanging on to paganism, even if weak, weakly, and doing so on conceptual grounds on the basis of, of their own principles were intolerable to the Christians uh, uh, who were coming in. So the Christians were not content till they had stamped out every last one that wouldn't capitulate. Uh, com they couldn't coexist with the M1, which to them was the worst treason, the believers in God who sullied the whole thing. But the Ds are much more tolerant of each other. On the pluralist, the D1 side, they liked the idea of juxtaposing, putting together all kinds of different things. And there's something exciting in the avant-garde. Of course, we won't you know, just give the kids that, but wake them up, have, let's take part in the modern stream. Why should we set the kids only you know, uh, in, uh, in, in the history class and talk to them, let them walk around, experience how Napoleon felt when he was exiled, et cetera, et cetera. And so they have no problem with the ingesting the avant-garde quote in moderation. And little by little, more and more. Uh, on the other hand, so that they provide no intellectual opposition to the D2s because they don't have intellectual opposition, they rejected ideology. Uh, sometimes you will find the, uh, the uh, uh, D2s, in some specific case, if they urinate on a cross, something like that, will outrage some small segment of the D1. It outrages much more any M, but, uh, but overall, they think it's fine. So that's what the government and the museums and all the rest uh, uh, the line on. And of course, the D D2s are quite happy. The D1s uh, are receptive to them. They're moving ever closer. They're getting what they want, which they never get from the public. So uh, they have no problem with D1. So I say in this case, in the West today, we have a unique modal situation, a harmonious modal coalition. Uh, with the power gradually shifting from one approach to the other. Now, the general public, of course, has no idea of this distinction. They will have no idea of D1 versus D2 or moderation versus nihilism. So the public today, in effect, views 
nihilists as an entrenched part of, quote, the system, of the way things are. A part of me that don't understand that that's part of the world the way it is. They have no idea that nihilism is, is operative or what relation, if any, it has to the taft act. It's all just, that's, that's the way it is uh, today. And of course, as time goes by, there will be ever less difference between the two to find. And this has a practical significance. It means that if an action by either variant enrages the country to the point of disaffection or rebellion, the two D modes are going to be brought down together. Uh, there's going to be nobody who is rebelling who says, I'll take D1, but not, uh, that's just not going to happen. Because they're going to be brought down for the same reason at the same time. And of course, the one that's most likely to provoke this is the nihilist side. Now, D2, like M2 and like I, is not a modal compromise. There is nothing in the mechanism, inher nothing in the mechanism inherent in the mode to necessitate its inner evolution to self-destruction. There may be a lot outside of it, but within it, not like D1 and M1. Actually, it is the final destination of the D1 uh, uh, evolution. It's not itself inherently evolving. Accordingly, as is always true in these pure movements, whenever they come up, they are the same. They're not closer to or farther from, they are what they are. So uh, uh, you take from uh, the earliest non-objective paintings to, uh, to the latest uh, you know, uh, mathematics where they don't teach numbers, they just count toothpicks, but they can't count, I don't know what they do. Uh, it, it, has, it hasn't changed in degree from its first appearance. What has changed, and that's true of most rising modes, a point I haven't turned to because that's not our main subject, is that uh, nihilism has found some modes, some fields rather, more ripe for early takeover than others. When a society, we, not a point we looked at before, when a society changes to another mode, it's not as though all fields flip over. Certain ones are easier, and they prepare the way for others, uh, etc. Now, the first one to go to D2 was serious literature. Because you see, only individual artists had to make that decision. And that happened, I was at the end of the 19th century, became a real movement, about 50 years into the Kantian era. Now, education is a public institution. We're talking about progressive education now. And that did not become a major factor until, say, a generation or more after that, approximately in the 1930s. And it had to be later, because the parents who didn't give a damn about Joyce uh, or Heisenberg did care about their children. So you couldn't take parents in traditional schools, even traditional pluralist schools, and throw this stuff uh, at them, or suddenly tell them, let's forget about texts and teachers and go out and learn by doing. First, you needed a generation which schooled the parents themselves and prepared them to be receptive to uh, schools and what they were going to do to their children. And almost as always, the final invasion by the new mode occurred in politics because that's almost always the last bastion to be taken over, unless we're talking about uh, you know, losing a war and having something uh, foisted on you, but if the citizens have a say. And I think among other reasons, it's obvious that uh, you can't have that kind of change until people, if not everyone, the great majority make their peace with what they grasp is going to be drastic change that affects every aspect of life. And you know that a different kind of government, people know, is more all embracing a different kind of school. So people really have to be prepared, and decades are necessary after the education is taken over. Now, in the US, 
detuned politics was born a generation after its uh, triumph in education. And that was, of course, the new left in the 1960s. And their graduates started to gain power about two generations later, pretty much in our time. <clears throat> uh, the uh, first, what I think, clear-cut sign of this nihilist uh, takeover, uh, or at least of the very, very strong, hot breath of it on the country is Obama, who I would say as the, is the first of the new left presidents, uh, or let's say quasi nihilist presidents. Now, I know you would love for me to give the rest of it to Obama, but I have a statement prepared on my view of him, if you want to ask, in the question. Now, even if I'm right about Obama, I don't mean to imply that nihilism now rules American politics, the way, for instance, modernism rules modern art. I don't even know that it is yet an enduring power in our government, because its flowering is so recent that you can't be that clear about, uh, you know, uh, it's, that it's going to stay. The way you can be clear about others that have been here for decades or even centuries, and especially because the nihilist in the United States has to contend with something unique that is not present in the other fields, namely the legacy of the founding fathers, a political legacy. Now, founding fathers didn't leave a theory of art which was America, or science or education, so people don't have that feeling, this is my country. But they certainly did in politics. It would be a lot harder uh, here. And we see, just going by the newspapers today, uh, I hope I, it will still be true when you hear the tape. Who knows? Uh, but right now, Obama is unpopular, and they're expecting significant Republican success at the polls in November. But what will ultimately come of such success, such success, even if it occurs? I don't think you can predict that now, but you might get some idea from the fact that throughout American history, Republicans have never reversed a significant status measure, and in almost all cases, introduced it. And then, you know, from Roosevelt to Obama, they just carried it on. So uh, a part of it will be, what is the Tea Party movement? What did it, what does it want? Anything more than lower taxes and less government? Does the less government include less expending, the slashing of Social Security, et cetera? Or is it just, let's cut out waste and bureaucracy? Because that doesn't mean a thing. All I would say, therefore, at this point, and I don't know the answer. All I would say at this point is that the D2 movement now definitely has its foot in the door and more than its foot. Now, quickly on the size of the D2 movement, in other words, the number of active supporters who understand and agree with its essence, I think they're almost entirely within the intellectual avant-garde, if you still call them avant-garde, along with a lot of uh, fellow travelers in the schools, the art galleries, and the government uh, uh, that grants uh, art, uh, the art collectors, uh, modern art collectors, etc. There's a lot of those people, but they just imitate what, the, uh, what they hear. But they understand it, and they, can, they promote it. Now, these, the D2s, right off the public, as benighted and reaction. They have contempt for the bourgeoisie. Uh, but on the other hand, the public, and that including here most of the educated public, has no knowledge at all of the D2 mode or of its fundamental ideas for a very simple reason. The D2 mode has not publicized its views or in many cases even stated them publicly. 
not in terms accessible to a broad uh, public. Uh, all the other modes, all four, publicly define, even flaunt their uh, 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 real uh, beliefs. And people, therefore, uh, certainly educated people, generally understand whether they accept or reject. D2 says nothing. It, it says concrete. This is horrible, this is horrible, love this, but it doesn't go into the destruction of value and concepts as the end in itself in order to squash man into the dirt. They just don't say that on Ted Cobble. And even if they said that, this is the protection D2 has, they would not be believed. And their viewpoint would be incomprehensible and, and people would simply not get it. In fact, there are very few people other than Ayn Rand who ever grasped such, a, such an approach. And you know who is an, an exception? Who forever, whatever else I disagree with him, I would take my hat off to, because he's the only one in great historical literature who has the perfect, perfect D2 character, and that is Shakespeare with Iago. Iago is a pre-Kantian Kant. And you have to give, I always am in awe that Shakespeare came up with that. He must have seen somebody, but who, I don't know. Now you say, Americans don't understand uh, D2, but they do support a great many D2 policy. And that's certainly true from uh, affirmative action, garbage recycling, and so on. But I believe that in every case, they view these policies not as connected expressions of some fundamental assault on the faculty of thought, but as unrelated goals, pursued piecemeal, case by case, because it's practically necessary, or it's a short-term remedial uh, fairness. I don't think the recycler on the street is a D2. In fact, in most cases, I don't think he's anything. He has no modal uh, direction. He's just an unknowing implementer of ideas of which he has not the vaguest notion. So as such, he has no intellectual influence. But the group, the mass of people that follow these things do, because even though a series of concretes is put forth in each case uh, as a concrete, uh, a continuity of practice uh, is established, it becomes a, a, a perennial uh, thing that you just expect. There's gonna be something, something new that threatens the world or that's unfair. People get sick of it, but they haven't renounced it philosophically. And so you go through, you know, this is new, this is ridiculous. Well, maybe there's some, some promise to it. I don't know, it's very familiar. You hear it everywhere. We always did this. You know, so they just have to keep pushing uh, one thing uh, after the other. And that certainly helps, that momentum helps uh, D2. Even if the public doesn't know that that's uh, happening. So I would say the, uh, since the public and a lot of intellectuals are excluded, I would say D2 supported very small number. If I took a wild, arbitrary, utterly unjustified guess, Five or six figures, that's it, a million tops. So it's a tiny minority, numerically insignificant, but with an influence gigantically out of proportion to itself. <clears throat> now, I assume you're interested in the IMO, where it stands in the United States today. Well, in the culture, it does not stand. The I period was a brief exception in modern history and has gone from our culture for a long time. It's condemned, dismissed by Kantians in every field, and its products, from novels to politics, have been forgotten and by most of the country never discovered. <laughs> Especially because people have been educated for so long in D1 schools. Uh, so I, I, you couldn't look for it in, in the culture. But there's maybe another place to look. 
I'm omitting Ayn Rand here for now. Uh, we saw in Greece that an earlier culture, antagonistic to the establishment, persisted in the soul of the emotions of the later society to some extent, not in the form of explicit ideas uh, shaping its cultural products, but in the sense of sense of life, which was, you could see in the background, and potentially influential, and uh, in the special circumstance that took place, actually defeated th this, the established mode. Now, in Greece, the special circumstance was the infancy of this radically new I mode in the face of the whole history of man. Uh, and so the uh, religion persisted as a sense of life without having it chopped down. Now, in the United States, we also have special circumstance. Something maybe has uh, endured, but it's the opposite. Not an iron society with uh, religion in the background, but a, maybe an anti iron society with an eye uh, in the background. Because this is the first case in history of a nation consciously founded on an I philosophy. Throughout Europe, uh, which originated the Enlightenment, it was a mere transient cultural phase. In the United States, it was a principled commitment as the foundation. Ayn Rand first told me that. She said, never confuse the Enlightenment in Europe with that in America, even though it started in Europe and there was Europeans who led uh, the Americans to where they are, in enlightenment, it was like you're a teenager and now you grow up and forget it. In the United States, this is what I am, this is my identity. That's how it was founded. And its founders are still revered today, all but unanimously by the country uh, they created. Greece gave us the spectacle of an I society harboring an anti I background. Is it possible that the U.S. presents an anti-I society harboring an I background? Is there still among Americans a special sense of life legacy, a singular receptivity to secularism? And do you remember the old principle of Ethan Allen, reason the only oracle of man. How do you answer? You just know you're taking polls because people don't know. They don't even get the question, let alone the answer. And you can't look at the culture because it's not there. We're looking for the subconscious. So the most you can do as far as I can make out is sketch in impression. Try and go over some main areas and see what your impressions are. So here are some uh, few, again, I'm not going to give you the whole thing. Some of the impressions I, I see on the positive side. I think the main evidence is the long-term split between the intellectuals and the public in this country. And, and both sides know it. This is a unique split without counterpart in Europe. And you can see that by the fact that the public time after time rejects European trends. And you see the time lag necessary before they get institutionalized over here. Non-objective art started in Germany, which is a great place for it to start. Non-cognitive education had its roots in Hegel. Sex interpreted man, class war interpreted society, all that. Uh, I happen to have picked all German examples. Uh, it took a long time to force feed that into America. Uh, and the intellectuals complain, America is always backwards, which is a correct interpretation uh, given their uh, viewpoint. And you know, you can also point out that this is the only country in the world, and to my knowledge in history, where the intellectuals have contempt for their country and their countrymen. 
I never ever heard of a German intellectual denouncing Germany, you know, or an ancient Roman saying how wicked Romans are only in America because they come from one world and the public comes from another. Uh, also, of course, the public are denounced, and this is another good quality of the public as materialists. And they are in the sense that uh, they're more respectful than men elsewhere of wealth as a moral pursuit. Uh, they're less envious of the riches of others. They're more eager to earn success uh, by their own efforts. They're more confident of their ability to succeed in life. And your own has pointed out to me that there's a much greater proportion of small business in the United States than anywhere else. And that, that suggests an American premium on uh, initiative, self-reliance, and entrepreneurial uh, spirit, whereas the others go into big corporations or big government to be left after. Now, in political terms, you can see that Americans are less eager to subordinate their individuality to ever bigger government. Uh, every issue just about, from the very birth of the welfare state, it was 1880s, and Bismarck in Germany, it took 50 years till Roosevelt could throw it, throw it down here. And every element of it through uh, socialized medicine, which has been in Europe as a self-evidency for how long? Decades and decades. And the, the blood and toil and lies to get it dragged through here in the 21st century is another sign that there is a big uh, difference. Now, Jean-Paul Sartre, an awful philosopher, but made a very good point. He complained. He said, I can't deal with Americans because they don't believe in evil. In other words, in human impotence and depravity, they think any problem can be solved. All we have to do is think and work. They don't know that we're doomed and it's hopeless. And that, of course, this not belief in evil is the Enlightenment view. Uh, so commenting on that and a few other things, Ayn Rand said 40 uh, years ago, for, if that's the place where she said it. Anyway, she said 40 years. She came to a conclusion. I'm dropping out some other people here. But it's, what I mean to say is 40 or 50 years after Sartre's remark, which is really a high point, let's try to look at the other side of the question. Now, if you accuse me of pessimism, that's your problem. Because you, uh, uh, you can't be an optimist if you don't uh, know the facts. Otherwise, jump off the Empire State Building and say, benevolent universe, all is going to be well. I don't believe in evil. I think that uh, there is still a split between the intellectuals and the public, but uh, it does not seem to me that the root anymore is so much common sense uh, on the part of the public, but religion. That seems to be the loudest opposition to the intellectuals. We'll look at that next time. I think there's definitely less respect for profit makers, more hostility to big business, to the, to the rich, greater willingness, worst of all, to sacrifice material goods if demanded by fashionable uh, groups, such as ecological groups, uh, ethnic groups, economic groups. Now, people don't like it, but they do not protest the way they once did. Less confidence, I think, in the individual's ability to, to survive on his own. And I think people do, to some extent, believe in evil in this way. Everybody senses the decline of the country and its apparent inability to cope with enemies abroad, even though it has this vast military. And I think a strong mental set is, is in the wings or starting as we can't make it 
uh, we can't do it. They're going to. Now, I don't think that's there yet, but uh, there's signs. Um, looking more specifically at politics, uh, much of the public still strongly declares its opposition to big government, but nevertheless, the most of the active subgroups here regularly demand the retention or expansion of handouts and policies that they think are essential to themselves. So on the one hand, Americans are proud of their nation's long history of upholding men's rights, and they venerate the Constitution that protects these, but the same people, or a large number of them, accept their country's history of increasingly violating men's rights and increasingly accept the reinterpretation of the Constitution along ever more Christian uh, and or egalitarian lines. Now, I have heard the following. I wouldn't say by any means it's impossible. Uh, I've heard that from people that the Enlightenment ideas are now largely rhetoric, that people actually have no coherent ideas or even feelings on the subjects, and this is an example that has been cited to me. What would happen if the representatives of today's America, not just union leaders or Democrats, but a cross-section, were to gather at a convention in Philadelphia to update the Constitution? Let me see by a show of hands, how many would be in favor of that? How many would be against that? <laughs> so the idea was, the conclusion many people come to is, they would most likely turn out a constitution the opposite of the original and would do so in the sincere belief that they were merely modernizing, not destroying the work of the founding fathers. I don't think you can get away uh, now with the fact that the public's character has changed across the generation. That's inescapable. Change for the worst. People today accept either happily or passively, indifferently, or unknowingly, but one way or the other, they accept countless development that their ancestors, even a few generations back, would have found horrendous or even inconceivable. For instance, our grandfathers were accustomed to high school graduates with a reasonable literacy and knowledge. Do you think they could even have imagined today's deconceptualized teenagers? Now, students from 40 countries were tested recently, industrial, in the industrial world, and the Americans placed 25th. I think they were just behind Bulgaria. <coughs> Was that a national uproar? Do you think our grandfathers, having participated in the nationwide rage when Truman attempted to take over the steel mill? Uh, on which he backed down. You think they could have imagined uh, a time when a good part of the public would cheer Washington's takeover of the banks, the auto industry, Wall Street, and, and who knows what next. Uh, I'll give you one last example. The, our grandfathers would remember the nation's behavior uh, in urgency of going to war after Pearl Harbor and refusing to settle for anything less than unconditional surrender. Do you think they could have imagined their grandchildren acquiescing in two successive presidents' non-response uh, to 9-11 because the junk that goes on in Iraq and Afghanistan is not a response? I say whatever else is true, 
Americas today, Americas today would be literally unrecognizable to the uh, founding fathers that they extol on the 4th of July. <clears throat> so let's add it up and try to give you a chance to ask the two questions I couldn't get into the lecture. Uh, what is the evidence in regards to the American sense of life? It's incoherent. It's almost systematically contradictory on every point. So if you ask what does the typical American today feel about man and life, is he still at his core a descendant, however confused of the enlightened? Or is there still a typical American? Or have so many slipped into ethnic and other self-identification that there is no such feeling on a historically significant sense? Has the sense of life, if it does still exist, has it faded to the point of historical irrelevance? In other words, there's not enough there, not enough felt, not enough active so that you can do nothing with it. Is there just like an eclectic juxtaposition? Now, in my view, there is some evidence for and against all these interpretations, none of them conclusive. The only way, I think there's only one way to find out, not by polling people or looking around, it's too inconclusive. I believe you can never know until the philosophy of the enlightened is presented to the country in explicit terms, but above all, terms understandable to them. And that means on a much more straightforward uh, level than anything uh, I think we're all uh, familiar with. If people could come to grasp the philosophy, there would be one of three reactions. It would clash with what they feel, and then you know the sense of life is gone. It would be indifferent, they couldn't care one way or the other, and then you know there's nothing left. Or something in them would say, yeah, that's what I really feel. And if there was some of that, and the rest were just passive and indifferent, uh, you'd win, and you'd know. So I think the answer to the sense of life is let people find out what, uh, what is involved and then let them react emotionally, which will pull their minds. But I do not think, oh, this is another lecture, and now I'm going to kill your question, question period again. I don't think you can reach the country by a lecture. That's where culture comes in. You can reach it only by the schools, the, the novels, the, the theories of matter, and then later, the government uh, programs. If you just get up on national TV and say, ASA, and so on, this is what Lagman believes, you may as well forget to waste a month. And I think you know that the subconscious by itself cannot win by itself, only if it is armed. Now, what the status of that is, I'm leaving uh, for the uh, last <clears throat> lecture. <clears throat> I go this far today. I think this much is epistemologically, logically justified. There is some evidence, by far not co co coherent, consistent, but some. Uh, and in epistemology, you are entitled to say, if there are some evidence, it's possible. That's it. I don't say probable. I don't even say, you know, there's such a thing as barely possible. But I don't even qualify it. I think you can say uh, <clears throat> it is possible. And you can certainly say it's possible that it's gone. And uh, I think between these two, what Ayn Rand said 40 years ago, this was the quote, Quote, it is impossible to tell, unquote. 
I will say a little more in the last lecture. So I am going to shamefully omit M1 from this uh, discussion. The reason being M1 is utterly dead, has been since the 17th century. M1 is a mixture of Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle has gone completely. M1 was possible only with the pagan M1 element combined with religion or with the Aristotelian element combined with the church. But it's completely gone now, so there's no mixture, there's no movement. And I've, I go through uh, mainline Protestants uh, and the Catholics, and I'm very content, you, you read my book, to say there is no M1 in our future. We don't have to look for it. You'll never find it. As a matter of fact, it's so rare that the only really, really clear example of M1 that I know today in America and has quite a following, but not enough, is Dr. Laura. Strongly religious, but she wants to get down to business in this life, you know. <clears throat> so I just want to summarize the status of secularism in the U.S. today, because this is what non-secularists face. You forget about I, you forget about M1. I is unknown, M1 is long dead. D1 and D2 are now a unit, and that, in the American mind, is the philosophy of secularism. That's the only thing people can even conceive of as secularism. And this is the secularist message that they get. To believe in this world and only this world, we must reject the idea of external objects. To extol a distinctively human faculty, giving us knowledge beyond perception, is arrogance and pretense. To seek a moral code based on objective fact is to surrender to a discredited fantasy. And if all this makes you unhappy, if you feel you cannot survive on Earth without reality, thought, or value, then you are failing to recognize that life on Earth is inimical to man. The natural world simply does not give us any of the fundamental answers that you want. So learn to face the ultimate truth. Existence is chaos, and we have no future but doom. This is what we ask you to do in championing nature. Now, you think, I think you can see that that's a kind of temptation to another viewpoint. And that happens to be what we're going to look at next time. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't do that. I thought I'd cut it totally. You add a little word here and a little word there. And it's like Ever Dirks has had about the budget, another millionaire, another millionaire, that's up. Okay, I already gave you two questions, but if you don't want to ask them, at least you know. Yes, go ahead, speak loudly. So uh, when the Ds and the Ms split the conceptual and the perceptual world, it seems that they mostly do it on morality and everything else. Uh, is it that clear a dividing line? And if so... No, absolutely not. Conceptual applies to every form of knowledge, of, of human knowledge, in every area. Morality is one branch of philosophy. Uh, physics, sci uh, the, the principles of, of lecturing, anything you know, mathematics, how to sweep, street, sweep a street, that's all conceptual. So it has nothing, it's in no way restricted. Uh, oh no, you better let him go, because I'm hoping somebody ask the questions I want. Yes. There's somebody over here, yes. Um, yes, in um, my experience up to the last two or three years, um, I've always seen 
uh, an exposition of, let's say, in an engineering course, um, of how a principle, a question about how you would solve the following problem, the student, the students always answered, here is the principle that I'm applying, and here is how so it So you're telling these students are more principled than my experience. Now. That's all you have to tell me. It's not true. You were lucky. That's all I can say. The overall student body has no capacity to think. Next. Uh, well. That, no, I don't want to back. Excuse me, sir. I have time for back and forth. Yes. <clears throat> from, from what you've observed in today's culture, what would you say is the um, general trend that I can appeal to um, in Americans today when trying to sell them objectivism? What is the general trend? There is no general trend. I mean, you're talking about politics. You can find a Tea Party or a, a people, if they're not religious, and try to show them that if they want less taxes and less government, they have to cut programs. Not just say limited government, but say what they want to cut. That, of course, will cut them off from the Republican Party, who will run, them, uh, run away from them. You have to create a culture. You're not going to affect a society by converting individuals on the street. You have to uh, uh, change the culture. And I've indicated my, the ways of doing it. Some people should go in the academic world. And then according to your preferences, you should go into physics, you should go into literature, you should go into education. Those are the fields that are going to transmit ideas. Uh, you don't want to do that, then I don't know, go ahead. You know, you can have blogs, etc. but the problem with those is you're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the converted. So if you want to get outside of that, you want something that reaches a wider uh, audience. And I, I don't think you're going to get very far by making uh, 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 the speeches that appeal to their uh, ideas. Yes? Uh, you that, uh, D1 uh, as a mode doesn't really uh, have much of a, it's not much of a threat to America in, in the foreseeable future, but that D2 is a current influence uh, and, I, and I understand you to believe that M2 is something of an impending threat. Is, is there any value in focusing on, is there any value of object, objectivist activists focusing on one mode versus another? Is there well, you'd have to ask me to think of a bomb for that, and since nobody will ask me, I don't know. I guess I think there's one of them is much more worth focusing on, but you'd have to understand why. I think it's definitely much more worth focusing on uh, M2 than on any of the Ds. Uh, I don't think the Ds are popular, and I don't think, I don't want to give my next lecture. So, um, but you want to know, a lot of objectives who want to know why uh, uh, I don't believe that, we, uh, I, that I don't, and don't believe in a big campaign focused on you know, the, the left, and, uh, um, et cetera. Now, I think there you can make a case uh, for voting for Obama. I, I think actually will, I mean, not for Obama, for the other side, if it isn't Sarah Palin, uh, voting for the other side in the fall simply as a buying time because Obama is going so fast that he's going to plunge us where it will take the other one some time, uh, you know, the conservative side, to get to. So he's not a typical, uh, you know, middle of the road or a compromise and let's, like, you know, put in one more thing. He's obviously steamed up and ready to go. And if he doesn't stop dead, I would, it'll, it'll speed up the timetable that I'm going to predict. I still don't think the D side will ever win but it'll really push us fast. So I would certainly try to stop him. But if and when the Democrats go back to, you know, their standard, everybody they've always had, then I forget about that altogether. I put them in over any Republican. But I have to explain that next time.
Oh, sorry. Yeah. I have a, I have a two-part question from uh, yesterday's lecture. Um, okay. What was the role of the ideas of Democritus and his followers, the Stoics and Epicureans, in oh, the trans... Oh, that's the history of philosophy. I can't go into that. Can't go into that? I, I don't regard Democritus as influential, not even on modern science, let alone on the Stoics. So that's too technical. A question. Okay. Yes. Okay, I want to give you a chance to talk about Obama. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, in particular, I was starting to get offended. Well, and, and what, what occurred to me when I was listening I have to you all this was, written down and I couldn't get it. Let, let me give you one quote. I was hoping you would comment on this. We hear about Rahm Emanuel uh, bringing the following approach to a lot of Obama's policies, and I've got a quote here from him. He says, You never let a serious crisis go to waste. Yeah, you can't waste a crisis. Yeah. So if you want to comment on that as well, I would well, appreciate Well, I mean, it. that's self evident. That's been statism from. Eternity started a war. Franklin Roosevelt started World War II to solve the problem of, uh, of uh, unemployment. As Ayn Rand put it, his solution was to kill them, send them all, you know, to die. So statists always start a crisis, but if one comes unasked, they're delighted. He's just more open. He's a real hooligan. The two real, in my humble opinion, your own knows this much better than me, but in my humble opinion, the two total hooligans in the government are Rahm Emanuel and Barney Frank. I mean, I wouldn't even put Nancy Pelosi in the category of humans, so I would. <clears throat> now, I do want to say a word about Obama. There's obviously not a large sentiment to hear my view, but. I think it is a mistake to describe Obama as a socialist. He is a different category of person. Socialism was a term which means state ownership of the means of production, and then implicit in that, uh, 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 control over all aspects of a, citizen, of a citizen's life, because he can't do anything if he doesn't, he can't, uh, uh, own anything. And that's why all the totalitarian, the, the medievals couldn't do that because they didn't know about me, means of production, but the Nazis is national socialism, communism is socialism. Sweden and the like are not socialist countries. A socialist country is a totalitarian country. They are merely the Swedish and those, are their mixed economies moving to greater control, but exactly as the United States is doing. They're just a little farther ahead than us. Um, now, so, uh, uh, socialism in, in that sense, totalitarianism, cannot triumph without thought control. If you're going to just, if you tell a man like Louis XIV, I want 10% of your, of your acres, and if you do that, I'll leave you alone, you, he doesn't care what you think. But if you want total control, which is what's entailed and complete uh, ownership, you have to see that everything about that person is what you want. You have to see that they take your ideology as holy. There has never been a totalitarian, uh, so, or in other words, socialist movement without a fervently held ideology, righteously held with uh, heretics, uh, unbelievers, bourgeois, capitalists, Jews, whatever it is, righteously punished for violating that ideology. That ideology is always and necessarily regarded as the fundamental necessity, the justification of uh, their policy, the promise of what it will bring to man here or in the next life. So it's a policy, it's a politics of floating abstractions. It's always M2. Obama, the, one of the keys to him is that he is angry, and his White House is angry, if he is accused of having an ideology. He denies flat out, and he thinks it's wrong to have an ideology and be you know, governed by these uh, uh, abstractions. Anytime you ask him, what does this imply? It doesn't imply anything. I'm taking over the, you know, the wall, wall Street just because they were cheating the people. That's all. You know, I'm doing this for the auto industry because, you know, these people were suffering, etc. That's it. 
This is not the means of production of the Son. He wouldn't dream of making a statement like that. He puts forth no long-range program. I mean, he has daydreams about solar power and world peace, but there's no, he don't know what's coming next, and he doesn't know uh, what's coming next. He knows these are the things he wants to push through uh, Congress right now. And he makes no claim for, this is interesting, a philosophic uh, validation uh, on any level. He doesn't say that he's an expression of history, of nature, or even that he's carrying out the word of God. Religious as he's supposed to be, you don't hear anything about God uh, from him. He has no ideological enemy. He's against business. Uh, but notice, he's against business with very, very little comment on all the good this is going to do to the poor. Now, a real socialist is saying these are the exploiters to be cut down in order to bring wealth and will have such a wonderful world. He doesn't promise the poor virtually anything. Well, equal insurance, but the equal insurance is not going to be much. He doesn't even bother to deny that. Uh, he wants, this is where I would put it, he wants ever greater state power. So he's consistent. But he consistently claims he has no principle. So I don't, I definitely put him out of M2. Of M as such, he doesn't want to enter. But notice also that he's frequently denounced by his supporters on the left as a compromise. He doesn't hold out for uh, what, what uh, they want. Now you say, well, it's just because he's in politics. And yes, but they're saying, to hell with politics. Politics is to reach this goal. And you're, you're just dealing around, you're compromising, you're wheeling and dealing. And he definitely does some of it. I don't think that's his distinctiveness, but I think uh, it, it's a fact that shows something. This is the puzzle with Obama. He's a consistency, which is not an expression of, of an ideology, He's driven by something, not a random dealing with concretes. And if you look at his program, it's clearly a passion for equality, but it's equality regardless of consequence. And that is the definition uh, of egalitarian. A communist can say we have to all be equal in the ideal world. And that will make us all happy. But the egalitarian says, I don't care what the results of this are. They all have to be equal. We want insurance for everybody. And he made the weakest statement, not even promises about how great the medical care. He said, you can keep your, in his promise, you can keep your care if you don't like this. This is just for a few. And he didn't even parade in you know, paralyzed people out of Mongolia, you know, Mongolian idiots, etc. He didn't tug any heartstrings. It's obvious from his actions that if he, you prove to him this will ruin the insurance companies, this will wipe out the medical profession, that's okay. We'll worry about that when the time comes. He wants to spread around money. And it's self-evident that if people don't have money, they can't create jobs, and he's worried about the jobless. Everybody has pointed that out to him a million times. Just give him more money as his answer. He doesn't care about the jobless. He wants to spread the money around, and that's not because he's giving it to the poor, it's because he's taking it uh, 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 from the rich. The most obvious example of this uh, is his uh, uh, policy on foreign policy. He going around telling each country how bad the United States is, how many things we're sorry for, we're no better than you. And if you ask him, what do you think the effect of that is gonna be on the United States security, on Iran and China and North Korea, et cetera, as you go around like that? His only answer is, this is the truth. I'm making up for this pretense of inequality. If we go down, 
That's it. He won't say that publicly yet. I think he represents destruction for the sake of destruction without concern for consequences. Uh, now, I still say he's not a complete D2 because there is a compromising political Chicago uh, element in him. But it's like the more modern schools. You know, they have the tradition for the huge chunks of progressivism. And there's such, in literature such a thing as magic realism where they have a, some naturalism, but it's all weird and crazy. I think that's what he is. He's got a little mixed economy. He's not necessarily one totalitarianism, but he wants to smash uh, as much uh, as he can. And I think a lot of the leftists who think he's a communist are going to be really disappointed uh, because that, I don't think that's his goal. He, if he had his way, there wouldn't be much left for them to take over. Sorry I'm late again. Thank you. <laughs>